My name is Jane Christian. I'm a Baramadigal woman of the Darug speaking peoples through the Reed Goldspink family line, with European heritages including English, Irish, Scottish and Danish. I have kinship connections to a Radjuri mob too, and I pay my respect to these lands that I'm being filmed on, and to this community, its elders, past and present. Across these lands now known as Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples collectively make up approximately 3% of the population. Australia being a settler colony, we know that this is by design, not mistake. You would think that Australia would recognise other colonial projects across the globe and understand their inherent behaviours and ultimate objectives. Yet so many people exist within this paradigm, rarely questioning it. And even if curious, often lack the language or understandings to ask us, maybe for fear of causing offence and perhaps for fear of having their questions answered. By the age of 35, being raised in the conditioning of the settler colony, while being decolonised in my home and community life, I found I could no longer go on spending the larger balance of my time in the spaces that were created by the flawed perspectives of the dominant culture in this place. And so I stopped. And some might call this a depression, a black BLAK burnout, or suffering a moral injury. I suspect it was a colony-induced combination of all these things a justified reaction to understanding the reality of this place and indeed my place in it. What I do know is that I felt a deep tiredness, my own soul's calling for rest and to be allowed an unapologetic and integrated expression of itself without having to be wide appeasing, complicit or accepting of the crumbs, often predicated on the Australian proverb that something is better than nothing and which often sets the standard of the bare minimum, which we should be grateful for. For only when your cultural identity is thought of by others, consciously or not, as one that should have been erased by now, it is also easily accepted that you should be grateful for any form of existence at all. Since the beginning of colonisation, a whole expression of oneself had been denied to previous generations who came before me, and I had become painfully aware that I too was being denied this experience. I came to understand that most people and places don't really understand the spectrum of Aboriginal experiences. Some places even have boxes to tick to say that we are there in them, but they still have such little comprehension of our knowings and ways of being, let alone their place in relation to us. So in my rest, realignment, resistance to main maintaining what was, an allowance of a more focused and integrated self. I wondered, when we've been historically denied spaces for our whole selves to exist within the mainstream paradigm, how do we create these spaces for ourselves? How do we heal intergenerationally fractured senses of self as a daily practice? And how do we ever heal when the colonial violence never stops? And I read, I read the likes of Dr Gabor Mate who offers that it's not what is outside of us, but what we hold inside that traps us. We may not be responsible for the world that created our minds, but we can take responsibility for the mind with which we create our world. And the late James Baldwin, who offered that you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not its idea of you. And the late former distinguished professor, Bell Hooks, who offered that true resistance begins with people confronting pain and wanting to do something to change it. These writers, among the other titles and attributes that they embodied, point to a process of going inwards, despite the discomfort, getting a very clear mind and taking action. While my journey has changed course, I've maintained a commitment to my own healing and cultural liberation in this place. After taking a pause, I started again, putting my time into what felt most inspiring to me, the relationships I value most and a cultural practice, which had been a good friend to me for over a decade, weaving. This practice is widely recognised as a Nutanjeri style of weaving, which was taught to me in the Wiradjuri community of Wagga Wagga. 
The revival of cultural weaving is an act of resistance in this place where such cultural practices and even just maintaining cultural connections with each other were forbidden and prohibited under colonial laws until quite recently too. The knowledges that weaving has taught and reinforced in me go with me in exercising my cultural responsibility on my own country and when I wander further afar. While I spend time weaving with family and community, I also spend a lot of time weaving in solitude, which is meditative for me. Assisting my mum and community aunts teach the practice on Wiradjuri country showed me the connection that weaving circles can foster between both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people who come together with good intent. Holding space for weaving circles on my own country with my mum showed me the importance of creating spaces for conversations grounded in connection and shared practice. It was on my country that I realised the powerful duo that is the cultural practice of weaving being a vehicle for yarns, storytelling, deep listening, and a way by which we can engineer an environment to hold protocoled conversations and practices. Not to create a dominant culture in order to weaponise it, but to create a space for our ways to lead and for our wholeness to be guaranteed so that in this presence there is the possibility that veils of ignorance conditioned into those we sit with will be shed. As with a shared practice comes a sense of our shared humanity. And in this connection of practice and story sharing, shifts can occur and healing can come about. Yet it feels like a slow process that can also become tiring, as I found myself creating weaving spaces in which we remained the cultural minority, responding to the dominant culture, even when they're the good ones, the ones who would actually take the time to sit and learn from you in both the practice of weaving and the narratives of the country that we sit upon. Last year, I created weaving circles overseas in Paris, and I felt some of the same positive connections that we tend to feel back here at home. I also felt a change in the receptive energy of those that I sat with, simply by being with people not conditioned by the intergenerational narratives of this place. On returning from Paris, where I had started creating my first exhibition, Girier and Revolution, that debuted at Blacktown Arts earlier this year, it was important to me that the exhibition space hosted not only the practice of weaving, but the practice of thinking and yarning. The weaving which carried the stories became a backdrop to the staunch yarns held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, having the yarns that we needed to have for our own connection and healing. And we didn't prohibit non-Aboriginal people from being part of the process. They were welcome to come, but only to listen. Just like too many people in their eagerness attempt to weave before taking time to watch those who are practised at it, too many people in differing proportions of guilt or ingrained superiority attempt to engage with and about Aboriginal people before ever taking the time to simply listen. And so it became important to me that my work created space for us just to be in the wholeness of who we are. Now, whether looking at climate change statistics or whether looking at what has become now the daily news, it seems to me that we are living in times, dire times, for humanity and country, for each one always reflects the state of the other. These are times where notions of accountability, justice and the very right to life and living a whole expression of the self have dystopian meanings for what feels like a majority of us but in any case, it's far too many. Where Western media selectively decides what the news is and how different communities are perceived in the telling of it. And where academic institutions, the producers of knowledges, have overwhelmingly become the enforcers of censorship. Where the genocidal mindset of dehumanisation and practices of erasure continue to sweep across the earth. And now more than ever, we need to be connected connected in our cultural practices, leading with our knowledges, and being our whole healing and connected selves. 
not only for the sake of our own inner worlds, but so that the wider world can become liberated through our integrated expression within it. Thank you.